All right, everybody, welcome. Welcome as you're trickling in. Welcome, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you are in the world. Uh, very, very, very excited about the conversation that we're gonna have today with my friend and peacemaking colleague, Robbie Damlin from Israel. And so uh, this, is gonna be, this is gonna be a dynamic conversation like the previous three have been. It's gonna be a unique conversation. And so I hope you've got um, your notebook and pen ready as I do. I, I feel like I become a better version of myself every time I sit with uh, with Robbie. And so this is going to be this is going to be a special time together this morning. As you're coming in, uh, I want to draw your attention to two features. One is the chat feature. If you would go ahead and open that up right now and um, let us know your name and where you're calling in from. It's always fun for us to see who you are and where you are in the world. Use the chat feature in the next 60 minutes as a space to capture quotes and compelling ideas. Interact with Robbie uh, in the chat thread. Uh, she's going to probably have her eye on that as well. And um, the things that you hear her saying, um, capture them there. It's a bit of a living document for us. Resources that emerge, go ahead and, um, and put links in that comment section. Connect with one another in this space. Use this as an opportunity to, to build some relationship as well. And then the second feature is the Q&A feature. Um, and this is a space for you to ask the questions. Please don't worry about asking the questions correctly. Just practice asking the questions. There are going to be things that come up for you um, here in the next hour that, um, that you're going to wonder about. Please put them in the Q&A, and we're going to do our best to get to those throughout. For some of the questions that we don't get to, though, we're going to be hosting a live debrief session on Tuesday evening, June the 15th, from 6 to 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Um, I'm going to put the link in our, um, our chat thread here in just a moment, but um, these live debrief sessions are sessions that I'm hosting for you. Uh, there's only 25 seats at this table, and it's an opportunity for us to move beyond just trafficking ideas back and forth to actually transitioning our learning into living, into practicing this. It's been a remarkable experience in the previous debrief sessions, and, uh, and I can only anticipate that the one after this uh, webinar will be just, uh, just as riveting. So here, I'm going to put it in the comment uh, section right now. Here is the link. Um, to our link tree, where you'll be able to register for that live debrief session. So here you go right now. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jer Swigert. I'm the co-founding director of the Global Immersion Project, and we're a peacemaking training organization that develops everyday peacemakers. And these are women and men who know what it means to join God and others in making all things new. From our point of view, Everyday peacemakers are women and men who are learning to see more accurately, immerse more courageously, and contend more creatively. Let me hit those um, just for repetition's sake, because it's very important. Seeing more accurately, that means that we recognize that our perspectives are not 2020 vision and that the healing of our sight is a lifelong relational process. Immersing more courageously means that we intentionally displace ourselves off the roads of comfort and into reality with relational and transformative intent. That means that we're not getting close to the pain to consume, we're getting close to the pain to be transformed, to build relationships so that we can be about the change together. Contending more creatively, we understand that the work of justice is not an individual endeavor. It's a costly collaboration. And as we always say, we have no idea as peacemakers how to contend until we've first seen and immersed. Our conviction is that restoration is the mission of God, and that makes peacemaking not an add-on to our faith or a kind of a, a cliche hobby. It's it's a practiced way of life. It's a habit of living. Our view of conflict is that it's inevitable. Uh, of injustice is that in all of its forms, it seeks to diminish the image of God in another. And so we see conflict and injustice playing out internally, that's within me, interpersonally, that's between you and I, and systemically, that's within the systems that seek to organize us. And so while we believe that the work of peacemaking absolutely has to achieve systems change, we also believe that it includes the slow, steady, hard work of becoming more healthy, whole, integrated individuals who are savvy at navigating hard conversations and tending to interrupted relationships and even bridging difference into new friendships. Put another way, uh, it's our conviction at Global Immersion that the only way to systems change is by way of internal and interpersonal peacemaking. And so everything that we do is designed to accompany you to walk that road uh, with wisdom and at the pace of love. That really brings me uh, to the Everyday Peacemaking webinar series called Restoring Friendship. This is a five-part series that we're taking the time to really focus on the dynamics of relationship. How do we do the work of peacemaking between 
uh, one another. And uh, I think it's obvious that our ability to navigate hard conversations and tend to interrupted relationships and even bridge difference into new friendships has degenerated in the last year and a half. COVID has impacted our ability to see the beauty in one another and draw near, especially when pain emerges. And so I think all of us are probably looking around in our families, in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, in our faith communities and saying, wow, relationships are fragile, but I don't really know what to do about it. That's the point of this five-part series. So in April, on April 29th, we had Australian peacemaker Jared McKenna talk to us about the, the process of becoming disarmed so that we can be about the work of peacemaking in the context of friendship. Uh, May 13th, Oshita Moore from Minneapolis talked to us about the tension between generous and gentle invitation and also boundary making and how do we know when to walk away uh, and take a breath and take a break. A couple weeks ago, Reverend Ben McBride out of Oakland talked to us about what it means to be hard on systems, but soft on people. Um, he invited us to exercise some more grace with one another, recognizing that we're all in journeys and in, in particular parts of, uh, of our journeys. And so what does it mean to give one another a grace and listen a little bit longer than feels comfortable? And then today uh, we get to learn from Robbie Damlin, um, who is literally for me, one of the best in the world at transcending physical and sociological barriers and boundaries to get proximate to her other and her constructed enemy. And then as we're gonna hear in this conversation, she does the work of transforming enemies into friends and then ultimately co-creating allies. On July 1st, part five will be with Padre Gotuma, who's an Irish poet and peacemaker. You maybe have heard him on, on being. He's one of the most prolific poets in the world right now. And he's going to talk to us about how we use language to disarm conflict and to move toward peace between us. And so again, that's on July the 1st. Um, and you can register for that in our link tree. Okay, that's enough uh, for now. Hit us up in the comments section, who you are, where you're from, questions that surface, hit them in the Q&A. Um, but that's enough of that. Robbie, thank you uh, for staying up and, and joining us in this conversation. It's a deep privilege to have you. And I wonder um, if you would just self-introduce yourself. Uh, I think a number of our listeners uh, know who you are and a number don't. And so uh, let us know who you are, a little bit of your life story, and then why you think a, a conversation on interpersonal peacemaking is important right now. Okay, so before I say anything, what I wanted to say is there's so many thousands and thousands of families who have been affected by Corona and have lost an immediate family member. And it occurs to me that one of the, the most important duties that we have as human beings now is to support the people who lost, the people who actually couldn't say goodbye. There's nothing worse than that. So that if you can't say goodbye, then maybe you write a letter to the person that you lost. But all of these people have also been isolated in their mourning, which makes it even more difficult because there wasn't that support. Women who lost their husbands are stuck at home. I mean, now that COVID is coming to an end, they can come out and now's the time to really support people. And I think this is going to be a worldwide trauma that has to be to show the humanity. You don't have to go and give advice to people who lost, but you can be next to them and support them and, and just be there for them. Mm -hmm. So I'm think that's me finished giving a speech. So, no, because it's something that I think we don't realize what is actually going to happen when, when everybody starts to try and function in their life again and everybody's terribly excited yep. about being able to hug somebody else. But what about those who can never hug the person they lost again? Mm -hmm. So I, I'm just saying that I think it's a duty of all of us. I mean, we have it here in Israel, mm -hmm. and I'm sure that all of you from looking at where you come from, you must have people in your area who died of COVID. And that's really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. I'm glad that you even start with that, Robbie, because it's like the, I haven't heard a lot of, um, a lot of conversation around in a post-pandemic moment, how do we collectively tend to the pain? How do we collectively grieve? And if we don't do that well, um, what is that gonna grow in us as a people? You know, if, we, if we're not allowed to or don't take the time to grieve, 
what's that going to grow? Versus if we allow ourselves to grieve um, and to hold each other, what would that, what does that grow in us? You know, um, so thank you for offering that. Okay, it, it, I think that it's the most, um, we haven't even hit the difficult period yet. And, and everybody can contribute to something to make life more gentle for those who lost. You know, um, I, yesterday I was doing, a, a, I call it Zoom and Glue, to, for, for a group in the States called Encounter. And um, it was very really interesting to see that they were so excited about going back to life. Mm. And I kept saying to them, but what about those who will not go to something that is even vaguely familiar to them mm -hmm. anymore? So that's part of, you know, we tend to look at other people's problems overseas, but what about in our own community? Mm -hmm. And it was the whole war situation that was here over the past couple of weeks and thinking about the children. I will answer what you asked eventually. Don't oh, worry. Yeah, yeah. Take, your, take your time. Take I just your time. feel like having a conversation. It's good. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, think about all the children that died in Gaza, for instance, and, and two children in, in Sterot, which is a village mm -hmm. on the border of Gaza, uh, on one in Ashkelon, I think. So how are all of these children who live in these areas going to grow up? The ones in Gaza with very little hope of anything. And so what will they grow up? What kind of human beings will they be? How much hatred will they be filled with? Because they, will know, they won't know anything familiar about the so-called enemy. They will never see his humanity. They're cut off. And the kids that live in the villages and in the towns on the border of Gaza, what kind of human beings will they be when they've grown up? And so I keep feeling that this is such a responsibility that we have, is to try to bring all of these children to a point where they have some hope. Because when you give up hope, you know, that's a very important part of the equation of peacemaking. And without hope, you won't make peace. So um, I think if I'm, if I'm talking about my own life and how things prepare you for a future, you know, obviously, or maybe not so obviously, because the Americans seem to think I'm British, which is hilarious, because <laughs> the British think I've got the most dreadful accent that you can possibly imagine. So I was born in South Africa and grew up in the apartheid days. And from a very young age, I knew there was something wrong. And I was very committed to social justice. Um, I can't see you all and I wish I could because if each of you, the, the ones that came onto this program didn't come here by chance. You know, there's something in their life that makes them interested in change, in social justice, however they might see it. So, um, I'll just tell you a quick story. When I was five, uh, I love animals. I'm a major animal uh, lover. And there was this guy that used to bring the milk with the horse and cart. And um, when he used to bring, it was a huge cart horse, and I must have been five. And he used to beat the horse. Mm. So I decided we can't have this. We're going to steal the horse. So me and my friend Barbara went off to the dairy with some carrots and various things, and we stole the horse, and we brought it home and put it in our tennis court. And then my father came home. You can imagine how delighted he was to find a horse in the tennis court. And very shortly after that, I was sent to boarding school. Okay. <laughs> you see, he didn't realize, they didn't realize that that was an amazing act of social justice. Mm. And so for the audience that I can't see, it's a question to take away with yourself. You know, what was your first act of social justice? What did you do to start off your life, you know, so that you're actually here today? Because you wouldn't be here if you didn't care. Mm -hmm. So um, I grew up and I was part of the anti-apartheid movement and um, mainly because I was totally ignorant. I had no idea what I was doing. It became very dangerous. Can you hear something weird in the background? 
There's just a little bit of a ring, but it's not obnoxious. You know what I think it is? I think it's my neighbors playing music. Hold on, I'll close. No, No, it's fine. I'm going to close the door. Oh, okay, okay. I was was thinking you were going to engage in uh, some some civil civil discourse with the neighbor. Close the door. um, Since the end of COVID, they've come out in drones to make play music outside my apartment. It's better than burning cars. Because yeah, two yeah. weeks ago they were burning cars outside my house. Wow. Uh, I live in Jaffa. Mm-hmm. So um, many of the things that happened in those days prepared me in a way for what I was going to do in the future. I didn't know it yet. But I, um, in the Six Day War, I decided when the Six Day War broke out that I have to come to Israel to save Israel. So I landed up working in a chicken house, which wasn't very militaristic. Mm. And I found myself, um, I really came for six months. I had no intention of staying here. I knew I had to leave South Africa, but I didn't think I would stay in Israel. I wanted to go to the States or to to England and and live there. But life come, life changes things you never know. And I got married, and um, I used to work the Jerusalem Post, uh, and um, had two little boys. And um, they grew up in a very open, liberal home with compassion and understanding and accepting of the other. And then comes the day when they have to go to the army. So Iran is the oldest, and he went to the army. And I remember standing with David at the bus stop and thinking to myself, how can it possibly be that my child is going to carry a gun when everything that we've always spoken about was nonviolence and, and, and compassion and looking at your, your neighbor and seeing him. So when I say looking, I mean also seeing. Mm-hmm. And so then um, there was a year and a month difference between David and Iran. My other son, David, also had to go to the army. And they finished the army and one went to South America and one to India. This is what happens very often with kids who serve in the army, especially if they are faced with civilian populations. Mm. It's an escape. You know, I think you call it a gap gap year or the British call it a gap year. Mm -hmm. But in this case, I call it an escape year because they go away not to think about what they had to do in the army. Mm. Um, they came back and went to university and David was studying um, at Tel Aviv University for his master's in uh, the philosophy of education and and also psychology. And um, he was called to go to the reserves. And every kid who serves in the army has to go to the reserves until you're about 40 something, you know, once a year. And he didn't want to serve in the occupied territories. He'd signed a note for officers who said they would no longer serve in the occupied territories. And he came to see me. So you see, I don't know how many of you have been to Israel or understand the psyche of this place, but the army is an integral part of life here. It's not, you aren't, uh, you know, it's a people's army. And so kids are very, very torn with their values and with what the country expects of you and how you were brought up. And he came to see me, David came to see me when he was called to go because this was the first time in his reserve service that he would have to serve in the occupied territories. Mm -hmm. And he said, I don't know what to do because if I don't go, what will happen to my students? He was teaching kids philosophy who were gonna be inducted into the army couple of months after. And if I don't go, what happens to my soldiers because he was the officer? And if I go, then everybody in all my soldiers will treat people with dignity and so will I. And of course I was filled with a sense of dread. And um, the extraordinary thing is I really understood what he was talking about maybe, I don't know, um, three years after he was killed by a Palestinian sniper. I went to give a talk at the American embassy in Tel Aviv and there was a Palestinian in the audience and he said, 
he came to talk to me and he said, you know, I drove through that checkpoint the day before your son was killed. And um, this very tall man came to talk to me to check my papers. And he said, I'll do it as quickly as I can. It's like paying income tax. And they got into a conversation. And then he said, and the next day when I heard your son was killed, I was so sorry. You see, that's the essence of what was going to become all of my work later on, was to find the humanity in the other, even if you don't agree. But that empathy of finding the humanity changes everything. And um, so then I understood much more. And um, I knew when the soldiers actually came to tell me that uh, David had been killed by the sniper, one of the first things that I said, and I don't remember saying this is, you may not kill anybody in the name of my child. Mm -hmm. So there was something already there that was going to, to change who I, you, to change my life completely, it took over my life. That's a pivotal moment. You know, the decision of what you are going to do, are you going to go on a path of revenge when you know that there's no revenge? Are you going to build um, monuments? Or are you going to die with your child as many families do, not physically, but they just disappear into themselves? Or do you want to do something to prevent other mothers from experiencing this pain, which is indescribable? It's like somebody comes and tears your heart out. And I gave a talk in Tel Aviv, um, maybe three months after David was called, was killed at a huge rally of about 60,000 people. I don't know where all these possibilities came from that I could. I just remember Iran, my other son, standing at the bottom of like the stairs that I had to walk up to talk and pushing me up the stairs and saying, you're doing it for David. Mm. And I made this whole speech, but it was so prophetic of what I was going to be doing. And it was all about um, the fact that if we wanted to live in a state of peace, we had to do it together. That means Palestinians and Israelis together, and that the Palestinians deserve to have a homeland just as we do. And uh, some, a man, a very religious Jewish man who started this organization, the Parent Circle, um, actually was probably at the demonstration and there were a lot of stuff in the newspaper and a lot of things that I said, which might have been considered controversial, but that actually is who I am. So, you know, you have to tell the truth. Mm. And um, he came to see me and he said, let's, I want you to come to a weekend to meet Palestinian and Israeli bereaved families, which I did. And I remember sitting around this table and looking into the eyes of this Palestinian mothers and realizing that we shared the same pain. All mothers are the same. I had a lot of dealings with the black mothers and the mothers of the policemen in America. And we spoke at the Martin Luther King uh, Museum. And I, I, I remember, you know, there was no need to build any bridges because we understood immediately we shared the same pain. And then I thought to myself, wow, you know, if I can stand on the stage with a Palestinian and we can talk in the same voice for nonviolence and for reconciliation, wouldn't that be the most extraordinary example for the rest of the world? Wouldn't if we who are the least likely people can do this, then surely others can too. And I started to travel all over the world with a Palestinian partner and giving masses of lectures and thinking that I was terribly important. And that, you know, how many I was in the House of Lords and in Congress and the Senate, you name it, all hip hop concerts. And um, one night I was sitting at my computer and suddenly there was a knock on the door. And I opened the door and there were three soldiers standing there. Now, when you open a door and there are three soldiers, it can only mean one thing. So I slammed the door in their face. I thought, I cannot possibly lose another child. There's no, I can't even hear this news. So I kept slamming the door and they kept knocking. And eventually they came in and I let them in and they said, we came to tell you that we caught the man who killed David. Now that's when it became difficult. Because you see, you guys can, all of us can go around the world talking about, we want peace, we want reconciliation, we want nonviolence, blah, blah, blah. But do we actually mean it? 
And, and this is not about somebody else judging whether I mean it or not. It's about your own integrity. So this was difficult. You know, now there was a face. It wasn't like some nebulous character who killed my son. And by the way, one Palestinian killed my son, not the whole Palestinian nation. And so um, it took me three months. I wrote a letter to the family. At any point that you want to stop me, uh, you actually can. Oh, I, I, I go on. I'd no, I, <laughs> I, I, I know. I, I will. I'm just letting you roll. This is, this is, um, please continue. Yeah, keep going. So I wrote a letter to the family of the sniper. His name is Thayer, to tell them about David and who he was, to tell them about the parent circle, because we are 600 families who've all lost an immediate family member. And what we believe is that for any future political peace agreement, there has to be a framework for a reconciliation process. And also that we should meet. We owe that to our children and grandchildren. Mm -hmm. So two Palestinians from the group took this to the family. You can imagine how shocked they were. And they said, if everybody would sign on this letter, then maybe there could be peace and that they would tell, give the letter to their son. Uh, I am not the most patient character in the Middle East. So I imagine after like, I don't know, after a week, there'll definitely be a letter, you know, from, from Thaya, from the sniper to say whatever he wanted to say. And of course, there's no such thing as instant reconciliation. It is a process. It is a process that may never happen. But it, and it may take years and it may happen overnight. Mm -hmm. And so um, it took almost three years till I got a, a letter from him in which he said that I'm crazy. Well, he didn't have to tell me that. You know, I knew that already, but also that I should stay away from his family and that he killed 10 people to free Palestine. But I knew that when he was a very little boy, he saw his uncle violently killed by the Israeli army and he lost two brothers in the second uprising. So he went on a path of revenge that he became a folk hero afterwards because he killed 10 people for the Palestinian people was obvious. Mm -hmm. But something amazing happened to me when I got that letter. The thing, you know, there are all these tests that come along to see if you, who you are and if you mean it. And I suddenly recognized that actually I've given up being a victim. You see, when you're a victim, you can never move on. And that my life would no longer be contingent on what this man will do. That I could find within myself the sense of peace to continue with this work. And that giving up being a victim, and it doesn't have to be for something so dramatic as losing a child. You have a fight with your wife, I don't know, uh, or your parents, and, and this goes on forever until you clean it up. It doesn't mean that you forget or that you give up your right to justice or that it's okay what the person did or that, you know, any of those things. But the question is, are you going to sit with this and be the victim for the rest of your life? Or are you going to open your own self to, to this being clean, you know, mm -hmm. and being free? Mm -hmm. and so I found that I was free and we went to South Africa um, to make a film it's called Robbie, One let, me, let me let me pause you really quickly because I, I know that this there are many of us who um, are probably resonating very deeply with what you're saying about victimhood um, and I think we all have in our human shared human experience um, we resonate with that like it's there are moments when we just want to remain the victim you know and, and you're saying if you're a victim, if you if you hold on to being a victim, you can never move on. And um, and I, I agree with you as well that like this this does happen in the context of relationships between partners, relationship between kids and their parents, relationship between former friends, right? And we memorialize that pain, and then, and then we remind ourselves why we're the victim, and then we justify our terrible behavior toward that other person because we were hurt, you know. And talk to us if you can practically in in your experience. That ex the the practice of releasing victimhood. 
Well, what did, I, what did I, that I, look like? like to saying, you? What does it feel like to have a baby? You know, it's, it's like, um, I, I can tell you why people hang on to it. Because in many cases, because it's something I've been thinking about a lot lately. And I think it has to do with the fact that maybe you feel disloyal. I'm talking about now in a circumstance of losing someone or, or someone being hurt around you and never forgiving. It's because you think that maybe this is being disloyal or maybe you'll forget what happened. I can't forget my child. I There's not a day that I don't wake up in the morning and have this picture of David above my head and I look at him and I think, what a waste, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and how much I love this child and, and how extraordinary it is that, that I can be grateful um, for the extraordinary experiences that I've had since he died and that the fact that I could be a catalyst in the life of other people for them to give up and to go through a transformation of forgiving and not looking for vengeance or violence. You know what a, a gift that is? Mm. To find somebody that you, you work with and you suddenly see the whole cleanliness. And it comes also through telling your story. Mm. So a lot of the polarization, and we all know that there's quite a lot of that in your country. Yes. But I would tell you that the people are much more similar to you than you think they are. The ones that you won't talk to the ones that you, you are angry with. I promise you that I've, I've actually seen research, the not knowing the other or seeing their humanity or even hearing their story, even if you don't agree with them, but listening with empathy, wow, that can just break down so many barriers. You know, when the Palestinian women first come to our group and they tell the story of loss, it's probably the first time that they ever could tell that story. And so what they do is they tell all the gory details. It's like the whole, um, where the bullet was, how much blood there was, how far it was from the gun, all the story, the body, or everything. But the more they tell the story, eventually they get to the point where they talk about the person that died. And that's the next level of healing. But telling stories is such an important thing and everybody has a story. You know, you don't need something so dramatic like I had in my life to be able to have an, I was working in um, San Diego at the university and there were kids there. I was giving classes to some of the kids there who I think if you gave them a map, they couldn't find Israel or Palestine on the map. And I, I thought, how am I going to get these kids to all talk to each other? Because, you know, there's always some that are the in kids and some that are the ones that are being bullied and some that nobody takes any notice of. And so I said, OK, we're not going to talk about Israel and Palestine. You're going to tell me where your grandparents came from and how you got your name. Mm -hmm. You would be amazed what happened to that class. You know, because suddenly they began to understand what it is to be a foreigner or to belong to a family that, that, that gave you the strange name because it, it reminded them of the old country or something like that. And all of these things of telling stories, just sitting in a room with people is, is actually how we work because it creates an emotional breakthrough that I tell you my story of loss or you tell me your story of what your life was like, you know, and it's very important for the first person to really be honest and open because then it opens up a safe space for everybody else to really talk from the heart and to say, you know, I was in Sri Lanka. Um, I must tell you that the Palestinians in our group reckon that if the Hamas will kidnap me, they'll give me back in about half an hour because I talk so much <laughs> with 3,000 shekels. <laughs> so mm. I went to Sri Lanka and I was giving a workshop and there are many, many families there that have no idea what happened to their children or their husbands, it's just disappeared people. 
And there was a woman sitting next to me and I could see she wanted to say something. And I decided it's more, I'm gonna ask her because she needs to talk. You get this sense, you know? And I had told my story, so there was a very safe space in, the, in that class of people to talk. And she suddenly started to tell me the story of her loss, of how she lost her husband and her son with all the graphic details. But I stopped the whole workshop because I thought it's the most important thing that's happened here is this woman can talk because she's never, it turns out that she's never ever told the story to anybody. And so what happened the next morning I came and her whole face was all soft and clean, you know, from being able to tell that story. So it's a very important part of creating bridges between people is if I know who you really are, if you tell me, it's much more likely. Look, I'll give you an example, okay? Charlottesville. Mm -hmm. I listened, I was watching Charlottesville on the television and I thought to myself, wow, it's this incredible. Firstly, the anti-Semitic behavior there was so incredible because I think to myself, always I ask, there are 14 million Jews in the whole world all over the whole world. We can't be, I mean, how much influence can we really have if we're only 14 million in a world of millions and millions of people? But never mind, it appears that we make quite a lot of noise for a small nation. And then I was watching this and I thought to myself, wow, maybe if white people would have gone down into the park together with African-Americans who had slavery backgrounds, and they sat in a circle around that statue that was the center of all the arguing. And the African-Americans with slavery background would say why to take it down and the whites would say why to keep it. Now, it isn't that everybody will become Martin Luther King and hug each other and love each other after that. But what will happen is you will suddenly recognize how somebody else sees their history and what do, and how they feel about something. And that's the beginning of a conversation. And that's the work that we do in the parent circle, mm -hmm. which is so important. Yeah, and, and I, I, I noticed that, um, that Lori put the, a link to the, the parent circle in the comments section. Thank you for doing that. Um, I urge you to go see uh, what's happening with the parent circle. Um, Robbie, I, I think there's, um, there's the surface level storytelling that happens um, and, and it's efficient and it doesn't really get us anywhere. I think what you're inviting us into is a longer linger and a, a, a different way of asking questions that unlocks a person's story. How, number one, how do you create that space? Number two, what are some of the questions that you're finding that are helpful to unlock a person's uh, ability to share more of their story. Well, look, you had a talk, if I understood, was about the language of peacemaking, the rhetoric of peacemaking. Mm -hmm. And it's something that comes with experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've got a tongue like a viper. So I can wipe somebody out in about three and a half seconds and get absolutely nowhere. So I will give you an example. When there was a disengagement from Gaza, from the village, a place called Gush Katif, which was next to Gaza of settlers, um, we decided at the parent circle that we wanted to go down and empathize with the settlers. Because after all, they had been living in these houses for 30 years and certain generations and the government sent them there with their blessing and it would be, it's difficult for them to leave, but it's not that we didn't think they should leave, we did. But we wanted to show that empathy that I was talking about. And we went down to Gush Katif and it was interesting to meet them. And um, they took us on this tour around and they were convinced that they wouldn't be thrown out eventually. And then we went to a house and I was sitting looking around and thinking to myself, well, you know, it's easy for you to come and say they should get out. So then um, what I did was there was a woman there and she said, I can't leave because my son is buried here. So in the old days, I would have said something like, yes, and how many soldiers need to die before you will? 
But I didn't say that. I said, you're a mother and I'm a mother and the Palestinian across the road is also a mother and all of us have lost children. Wouldn't you do anything to prevent another mother from experiencing this pain? Do you see the difference in rhetoric is how you talk? And so of course she invited me to come back to her house and she gave me a whole bunch of books that I never read, but that's beside the point. It's this question of giving people dignity, of not closing them down, even if they don't agree with you. And the people who are, I'll give you another example. Listen, I'm a storyteller. I love You've got to send into trouble. Yeah. You know, so um, after David was killed, ah, uh, in the 2014 war, we had a tent. The parents circle made a tent in the middle of Tel Aviv to talk about stopping the war and about peace. And many people were very angry with us, as you can well imagine. It wasn't exactly the consensus idea, you know, and, but it was a wonderful place for people who, who agreed with us and wanted some solace, and also for people to come and shout at us. And there was a settler shouting at us. And he sat not within the circle, out of the circle, but screaming. And it was clear to me that nobody had ever really listened to his sadness. He'd been one of those people who lived in, in one of those villages that had to get out of Gush Katif. And he moved himself to a, kibur, to a settlement, which is so radical. You know, it's like jumping from the fryer into the frying pan. And he was screaming and screaming and screaming, and we all sat quietly and we allowed him. We gave him that space, which he'd never been able to say to, to people like us, you know, because you give us a label, mm -hmm. the peacemakers, mm -hmm. and maybe not, with, not a, in, a, in an approving way. And um, when he was finished screaming, I went to talk to him. And I said to him, look, I understand that you lost your home and how sad that is. But you are actually my brother and shouldn't you be together with me looking to try and prevent our children from having to go through the same pain as we went through. And then I said to him, I'm gonna tell you a story. The night before David was killed, uh, he was at a checkpoint in the West Bank. Um, a religious Jewish man came to talk to him about the philosophy of Judaism. And apparently they spent the whole night talking and in the middle, David got up and went to make coffee for his soldiers. And um, this guy said to him, listen, why are you doing this? You're the officer, they should do it for you. And he said, no, this is being a leader. So of course I would never have known the story, but it had a huge effect on this man who um, when, when David was killed the next day, the next morning, um, he wanted to come and see me. And he wasn't sure that he could come and see me. You know, he thought maybe because he's a settler, I, I won't be happy to see him. So he called me and I said, of course, please come. So he came to my house and he told me this whole story and um, how sorry he was. And when I told this to the settler who came to shout at us, he started to cry because there was a sense that I gave him his dignity and he said, won't I come to his, his settlement and talk? Mm -hmm. This is the question of how to, to change your attitude. You know, you don't always have to be right. Yeah, but there's, um, there's something- Oh, we're going to have a visitor now. Um, this is Hitchcock. Do you remember in the films of Alfred Hitchcock, there was always, he always was in every scene, like for a few minutes, he was in the scene of his movies. Uh -huh. So this is Sylvia Platt, the cat. <laughs> making, making, the cameo, making the cameo, making the cameo experience. The cat is making the experience. Sorry about that. No worries. Hey, th this is um, this is real life happening. A question for you. I, one of the one of the things that I have admired about you for a decade plus, Javi, is um, is how you. Our language for it is immersion. Um, and the way that we describe immersion is we intentionally displace ourselves. And in every Wait, story- I don't understand. Just uh, explain that again. It, yeah, um, to, to immerse is to draw near. And, uh, and, and especially for dominant culture folk, white folk in America, um, we, don't, we, can, we can live our entire lives without ever having to get close to anybody. 
There's nothing, we don't need to if we don't want to. As a matter of fact, our cities are designed to keep us away from the pain. And, um, and so we say that a practice of peacemaking is immersion. Uh, and for uh, dominant culture folk, it means to intentionally displace ourselves off the roads of comfort and into reality. In every story that you've shared with us this morning, I've noted that, um, that you have made intentional decisions to draw near another person, uh, whether it's going to a settlement, uh, entering into the Palestinian territories, wh wh whatever it is. I think we live in a space in a culture over here that we make all the excuses in the world for why oh, I don't know those stories because I, I'm not close to that. And, and I, I don't know how to get close. I don't know how to draw near. I don't know how to immerse. How do you immerse? How, how do you get close? And then once you're there, you're not just listening to a person's story, you're holding their story. How do you do that? You have to give up the fear. There's always this fear, which is creating polarization. The fear I'm going to lose my status, the fear I don't know what to say to this other person. You know, one of the major, this is going to sound really crazy, but I think that one of the major um, ways of, of creating closeness is good manners. Mm -hmm. I know that sounds crazy, but it is. And it's also a sense of humor. Mm -hmm. You cannot be this heavy person all the time that goes around, you know, with this grim effect. But please don't imagine that Israelis aren't exactly the same as the people that you are describing. Look, life is pretty easy for Israelis. We don't, they don't have to mix with Palestinians. 90% of the Israelis would have no possible idea of what it's like to live in the occupied territories, what it's like not to have freedom of movement, what it's like to have the army come into your house at 12 o'clock at night and, and you know, search your house. And sometimes it's for nothing. What it's like to give a kid of 18 a gun for him to stand at a place when he has no discretion or wisdom of how to really handle this. And when he's filled with fear. And that fear, what does fear bring? Violence. And what does violence bring? Hatred. And then we get this whole cycle. Look at this war that we have just had. How extraordinarily insane was this war? It's like 2014 repeated, except now we've got more sophisticated weapons. So you can kill more people, or you can send thousands of rockets, or you can bomb a building that just collapses so it looks like science fiction. Mm -hmm. And the children, and the mother. Look, I, you know, I was um, talking on the phone. I live in Jaffa, and the night that the war started, I was busy talking to Bassam, one of the, the uh, members of our group, on the, on the phone, and he said, you know, Robbie, I think I can hear sirens on the TV in Tel Aviv. Maybe you better go to the shelter. Mm -hmm. Do you see how insane that is that a Palestinian sends me off to the shelter? So I go to the shelter, and I think to myself, wow, how lucky I am. Think of this, because I don't live in Gaza. You know, I, I'm a mother living in Gaza. I don't know what to do with my children when this is all happening. We haven't got a shelter. If I leave my home, what will happen? Will I be considered a traitor? If I stay in my home, will I be bombed? Can I run to UNRWA and maybe be safe there? And then I'm an Israeli mother that lives on the border there. And I heard a mother talking on the radio. And she said, I have three children. I have 15 seconds to get to the shelter, and one of them is in a wheelchair. Who should I take? Now, where's your empathy for both sides? Where's your understanding of, of what is going to happen? Where is your compassion for the children, for a kid that at the age of 12 is waiting in his bed because he's been through so much trauma? Mm -hmm. You can't imagine how, you know, how, what it is to live in these circumstances. And, and we have to end this, and we have to give dignity to the other. Mm -hmm. we cannot, and we cannot assume that we understand other people's culture. You know, I just wanted to say something about the South African visit, because it's very important and it had a huge effect on my survival. I, I wanted to understand what the meaning, I want to explore forgiving. 
And there was a woman there who had been to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And she had told the people who killed her daughter, I forgive you. And I wanted to know what she meant. So we made this film and I went to her house to interview her. And I said, what is your definition of forgiving? And she said, forgiving for me is giving up your just right to revenge. And I thought, wow, you know, that is really an incredible definition. But even bigger than that was the man who actually sent the people to kill her daughter. And they together have a, a, um, an NGO now. And he said, by her forgiving me, she has released me from the prison of my inhumanity. By her forgiving me, she released me from the prison of my inhumanity. Now, I mean, can you imagine anything more dramatic than that? So you know, there are so many things that if you become part of the world and don't disconnect yourself from this, you will also experience, I am, People don't understand when I say I'm grateful. They say, how can you be grateful? You lost a child, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But of course that pain is there. Mm -hmm. But can you imagine how many extraordinary people I've met along the way yeah. who have gone through this whole experience of transformation, of understanding and of forgiving themselves. Mm -hmm. mm. You know, uh, and, and of understanding why. And the minute I realized that this man didn't kill David because he was David, if he had known him, there was no way that he could kill him. He killed his uniform. So this is hard to say, but if you want to go on a path of finding this kind of inner peace, it's like you have to be honest. Mm. And that's hard yeah. because that's all these tests that keep coming up, you know? Yeah, yeah. and this, this is, Ravi, like and I, I want to pause just for a second, and and to those of you who are listening in right now, as as a way of just expressing gratitude for the gifts that have been given to us in the last forty five minutes, um, in the comment section, maybe just post a thought or an idea or a quote that just struck you, um, that Robbie offered that that is impacting, it's working its way into you, just so that she can see what it is that's happening for those of you who are are listening right now, for those of of you who are listening into this recording, maybe take a minute and just write down what is what is the aha? What was the gift that was just given to me in this moment um, as as a way of just um, receiving that gift? And so go ahead and do that right now if you're if you're on the call. I, I want to for me, I, I want to point out the that there there is it. There's an everyday peacemaking story that just emerged on the global immersed social media uh, global immersion so, social media channels of a. Um, of a mother, a young mother in Phoenix, who said a, com a, a comment that really struck with me. She said, I'm not interested in the peacemaking platform. I'm interested in the hard work of becoming a peacemaker. And I, I think it's very interesting, as I'm listening to this conversation, there, I think there's this misnomer as pe the, the concept of peacemaking is becoming more um, acceptable. Uh, it's it's intriguing. It's dare I say a bit sexy. I, I want to be a peacemaker. But what I hear in the, what I've heard in this last hour is that peacemaking is not about growing fluent in issues of justice or change, and maybe grabbing a tool or two. Becoming a peacemaker is literally a lifelong process of formation. We give ourselves to the work of formation such that the habit of our lives is restorative that I don't have to enter into a space and go, okay, how do I hold a person's story? What are the questions that I ask? That over time, this is a way of life and I am a voraciously curious, gentle and sensitive question asker because I wanna unlock stories because I, I want to know and be known by you because I believe that you're a friend worth having and that I'm a friend worth having and we could probably co-create a better world together. And, um, and so I, I wonder, Robbie, how, how would you comment on um, peacemaking, rather, rather a fluency and a set of tools being a form, a way of life that is formed over time. How, how would you, how would you reflect on that? You know, it overtakes your life if you are really serious about it. It's not, um, it's not an idea. It's a way of life. And it's, there are constantly tests in the way to see if you really mean what you say. 
I mean, I got a phone call at one o'clock last night, okay? Um, uh, we did an interview on the BBC. Um, since the war, I've done so many interviews, I can't vaguely even remember what I said to anybody, but that's irrelevant. But I did this interview, they took two mothers and they interviewed us for an hour. And, you know, um, my partner was a Palestinian mother and suddenly she, they made a small trailer of this beautiful um, interview that we did with her pictures on it. And she got some ugly feedback on, on uh, Facebook and she suddenly got terribly fearful. Listen, it's much braver to be a peacemaker in, if you're Palestinian, believe you me. You know, I don't have to go through a roadblock. Uh, I don't have to have permission to come anywhere. Mm -hmm. I don't have to do, I have the freedom of movement. Please don't imagine for one minute that if you're a Palestinian, that it's such an easy choice because also within your own community, as I get. So she got frightened. Look, I've had things like I should die in Auschwitz and, you know, I don't even want to go into some of the charming things people have said to me. But this is the first for this girl. And so at one o'clock in the morning, the woman from the BBC phones me and starts saying, shall she take it down? She's terribly worried. And the whole story that happened. And I could have got cross, you see, and said, how dare she just, mm -hmm. how dare this Palestinian girl just phone up and say, take it all, take it all down. Mm -hmm. Five million people watch this, listen to this program. So, um, but you have to take a step back and suddenly put yourself in somebody else's shoes. I don't live in a small village in Bethlehem that all my neighbors think that I'm being uh, disloyal because I'm a peacemaker. You know, I have the freedom of movement. If I want to go somewhere, I go. And just think about how brave that is for this girl. And so, you know, then this went on for a couple of hours and I suddenly, but it's the question of compassion, of understanding how she was feeling. And then she reread all these feedbacks in the morning and she wasn't so fearful anymore. It was too late. We already took this whole thing down and I made sure that they're American friends. I mean, people share things on Facebook, so you can't stop it altogether. But nevertheless, we made her feel better by the fact that we had the compassion to go along with her. And I think that's a lot of the stuff that you learn. I'm no saint, believe you me, you know, I'm not. But I believe with all my heart in the work that we're doing, and it's very difficult sometimes. There are differences in culture. You mustn't assume that you know, but I can tell you that if you have good manners and you speak from your heart, it's probably about 80%. Of what of what you should be doing, and you tell the truth. Mm. The rest mm. is the truth. Ah, uh, Robbie, you need all these skills and yeah. you know, all these people to tell you what to do. Right, right, right. And and I, I want to draw a thread, and and um, I literally could sit here and and continue to listen and learn for hours. Um, but we're gonna we're gonna bring this particular conversation to a close here in a second. I, I do want to draw a thread back to your opening thoughts, and um, you you basically said to us in the very beginning that the tools that you need for the work of peacemaking were probably given to you in, in, in your early years. There, there were part, from, from your upbringing, um, from your experience as a child, and even regardless of what your upbringing even looked like, once upon a time as kids, we knew, we knew how to get close to another person who was in pain and, uh, and, and empathize and, and get curious and to hold and um, the, the, like it's all like and so like what you just said about you don't need all of these sophisticated tools to do the work of peacemaking. Just have a good heart. Have a good heart. There be have good manners. Ask good questions. Demonstrate that you care with your oh, body. Oh, by the way, eyes. it's not about asking good questions. There aren't any good questions. It's just being there. You know, it's like so much better to allow for people that talk too much like me, it's a lesson I have to learn also. You know, I sometimes actually physically stop myself from talking because it can be overwhelming, you know? And 
sometimes I have a lot of quiet in my life. You need that too. Mm -hmm. The days that I don't talk to somebody for like two days or, you know, I just yeah. am very quiet yeah. because this is exhausting. I have to tell you that now, after these couple of weeks with the war and all the media and all the, we did a wonderful thing on Christian Anampo on CNN and she opened up with Bassam, I did a talk and that opened the whole world and but it is terribly tiring because it's like giving the truth all the time mm -hmm. and saying what you really think. Mm -hmm. And some people hate that, you know? Mm -hmm. It's dangerous for them because you touch something that, that they fear. Yeah, spot on. Robbie, thank you so much. I, I, I'm gonna um, offer just a couple of last tids, tidbits here and then I want I want you to have the last word you've got a you've got a live <laughs> audience <laughs> no you, you've got a live audience here and uh and then there's going to be a large audience who's going to be listening into this conversation and so I, I want you uh I, I would invite you in a moment just to how would you encourage us right now um in light of this conversation but for those of you who are who are lis listening in live uh you're, you can expect a follow-up email with um, links and resources that emerged in this conversation, including access to Robbie and um, and the parent circle. So you'll have um, you'll have access there. Um, I wanted to draw your attention to two opportunities to connect further into this conversation. One is the live debrief session that's going to happen this coming Tuesday, the fifteenth, from six to seven p.m. Um, on Zoom. You can register here. The first twenty-five registrants to get access into that room. And again, this is this is for those who want to connect and then take these lessons and learnings to a next place. We wanna actually in integrate them into our lives. Um, so you can, you can register there. You can also register for part five with Padre Gotuma um, at, the, at our Linktree link there. I encourage you to do that and spread the word. This will be part five of five and um, it's no doubt gonna be another riveting conversation. I also wanna just draw your attention because so much of this conversation, not surprisingly, um, referenced Israel-Palestine. I'm not assuming that everybody on the call um, right now is, is fluent in a history of all the things connected to the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict. And so our friends and partners um, with the Telos group will be facilitating uh, uh, Israel-Palestine 101 uh, hosted by our good friend and Robbie and my uh, mutual friend Greg Khalil on, on June the 24th, seven o'clock Eastern Standard Time, four o'clock Pacific Standard Time. The link to register for that is right here. If this is if this is capturing your attention, if what's happening over there right now is uh, is intriguing to you, this is going to be probably the finest webinar that you can be a part of to begin to grow your understanding of what's happening there. Um, friends, as is always the case with our webinars, we don't we don't intend for these just to be consumables. We intend for these to be transformational environments. It's catalytic. For change and so um so whatever it was that you put in the comment thread that really stuck out to you the gift that you received my prayer is that it germinates and it begins to spring to life as i mentioned in the comment thread i think the world actually needs peacemaking to overtake our lives and um and we need to be correctable we need to try we need to move beyond fear and all those things and and um and my, my prayer will be that the seeds planted today would germinate um, into restorative ways of life, love, and leadership. And so, Robbie, thank you for the gift of your time and your friendship and um, the incredible work that you're doing that's echoing around the planet. Um, you got the last word. What's, what's, the, what's the last word for us today? I think the, the, one, the one thing that I want to say for those who take sides, please, if you, please do not be pro-Israel or pro-Palestine, because what you are doing is actually importing our conflict into your country and creating hatred between Jews and Muslims, and in many cases, also with Christian input. So if you can't be part of the solution, it's better to actually leave us alone. And that doesn't mean that you should not be involved in the solution. If you are part of the solution, we really want you but don't be part of the problem. That's a good word. All right, friends, blessings. Thank Thanks, you so Robbie. much. Bye-bye, everybody.